Hello, people of World War Zero. We're so happy to be here with you. And uh, I'm Amanda Little. I'm a professor at Vanderbilt University and a columnist at Bloomberg. And I am delighted to be interviewing Heather Zeichel, whose career I have been following for years in the public and private sectors. Um, and because it is such a big and <laughs> amazing career, I'm going to let Heather introduce herself, uh, the germane information, and then I'll jump in. Great. Well, thanks for the opportunity to join you today. Um, as you noted, I have uh, spent a few years in Washington, D.C. working on climate and energy policy. Um, I was lucky enough uh, to work in Congress for then Senator John Kerry. Uh, I worked in the Obama administration um, as, as, as uh, one of uh, President Obama's climate czars. So I've seen uh, the climate agenda from um, you know, the, the policy and policymaking and regulatory side. Um, but then I've also worked for uh, nonprofits um, and served on, on corporate boards. So I've seen kind of energy policy from a number of different vantage points. Um, I've dedicated my life to advancing clean power and today run the American Clean Power Association, a new trade association launched uh, just this year focused on advancing um, the general, uh, the, the advancing clean power writ large. And um, we focus on uh, wind, both on and offshore, solar energy, storage, and transmission. I'm uh, delighted to join you today. There has never been a better time to be exactly where you are, Heather. I'm so excited to hear about uh, what you're going to be doing with American Clean Power and um, and what this moment means for clean energy. But we have to start with Texas. I am in Tennessee right now, and it, there is a blizzard outside my window. I wish I could share it with you, um, but uh, uh, it's nothing like what's going on in Texas. Uh, and the amount of misinformation about the source of the power shortages there. Uh, Tucker Carlson said recently, the windmills failed like the silly fashion accessories that they are and the p and people in Texas died. Can you set the record straight? Absolutely. For starters, I mean, we need to have a fact-based conversation. Practical reality here is that renewables did not fail. The bulk of the problem that we saw in Texas was actually from fossil energy. But you know what? When temperatures dropped those levels and a state like Texas has never seen, like this is a once in a generation storm, they're just not prepared. And so the, 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 the practical reality is that whether it was natural gas, coal, nuclear power, everybody struggled with this. And, um, you know, I think that there, the, the irony here is to turn around and to blame clean energy when clean energy is actually what we need to do, be doing to avoid, you know, further. I mean, this this storm in and of itself um, is 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 a result of a changing climate, and we know the number one need to act is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and decarbonize the power sector, which is what our trade association is all about. Um, but to, to turn around and single out one single energy source when there were massive failures across the energy spectrum is just completely unfair. It's amazing to see the lack of leadership in Austin. I mean, you'd think that the enormous cost to Texans and, and, and the witnessing the center of the American you know, energy industry, uh, conventional energy industry brought to its knees um, would have forced Governor Abbott and, and, and you know, more, more broadly, um, uh, the, you know, Texan leadership to have a kind of reckoning around climate change and clean energy. Instead, it seems to be deepening the divide. And I wonder if you can speak to this. Well, I mean, listen, I, I think we could get wrapped up in the politics of climate action and clean energy versus coal. But what I'm focused on is, um, and, and what my member companies are focused on is first getting power back on and delivering um, delivering energy to the, the families in Texas that need it today. Um, second, you know, I, it is, it is, baffling to me how Texas, as a state that is the number one state for wind energy, um, can now turn around and say that was, you know, the wind energy was the problem. Um, we, the, the facts don't bear out. Um, I think in, 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 I expect that as there is analysis of what happened, why did it happen, and how do we, what do we need to do to avoid this from, from, from happening in Texas again, um, you know, the facts are going to speak for themselves. And what we are going to focus on is, is our companies are you know, continuing to deploy 
uh, clean energy. We know that's the future. We know that if it's wind or solar, we don't, uh, you know, we, we, we don't have, um, uh, we don't have to be subject to the, the costs of natural gas or coal. Um, and we, uh, we, we, we've, what we've also learned in this, in this instance is that um, there is an important role as great as wind has been and will continue to be. There's also a real important conversation that we need to have about what is the infrastructure? What does the transmission look like? How do we make sure that um, you know, we are, we are building out the transmission so that we can move the wind and the solar to the centers of, uh, to the city centers that, that need it. And then I also think there's a really important opportunity for storage and, um, you know, and thinking about storage as an energy source in and of itself. So I'm actually, you know, as, as, as ACP's CEO, I'm going to be focused on how do we use this as a teachable moment to think about, like, what do we really need to do to bring in the new technologies to decarbonize the grid? And that's where, where, where our member companies want to drive this discussion. And just on a very practical level, I have to ask this because there are, there is this, there are still people out there who think that windmills and solar panels can't function in snow and, and ice and cold weather. And of course, we know Scandinavian countries, these are very, very compatible with cold weather climates. Can you just like put that yeah. Yeah. in very clear terms? Yes, yes. Well, first, let this is as clear as I can get. First and foremost, wind power and solar power can absolutely function in sub-zero temperatures. And if you and, and and if you you don't have to look any further than the state of South Dakota or North Dakota, because today they get 30% of their power from wind turbines. And as somebody who grew up in Iowa, I know it's incredibly cold in those states. Yeah. So the issue is not whether or not these technologies can work in cold weather, but what was what 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 the, the manufacturers of, of wind farms do is look at like where is this project going and how do what do we what do we need to do? There is something called a cold weather package that goes on projects that go in, in really cold states like Minnesota and, and those in the, in, in the Midwest. And those allow the turbines to keep moving in, in cold weather. Unfortunately, in, or fortunately, I, in Texas, there, this is kind of this once in a generation storm event that has led to these yeah. unusually low temperatures that nobody really expected. So it's the same, so you're seeing the same thing across the entire energy mix, right? Like people did not plan for it to ever be this cold in the state of Texas. And, um, you know, I think the, ind the industry is, is, is working quickly to get those, those wind turbines and solar panels back up and functioning and bringing clean power to the families and businesses in Texas. So this moment is so important, and I just want to, um, you know, emphasize the Biden administration has come in. We have heard so many um, folks saying that this is really a critical moment. Um, uh, Werner Hoyer, the head of the European Investment Bank, tweeted gas is over in the first days of the Biden administration. Can you kind of speak to that? Does the Biden administration herald the end of fossil fuels? Well, I think we have to look at the what what was Biden campaigning on, and he made it very clear that climate change was a central issue. He looks at that through a lens of job creation and economic growth. He looks at that through the lens of foreign policy, and he looks at um, he looks at that through like a, a, a public health lens as well. So we know that he recognizes the need to decarbonize by 2050. He's had he's set for for our industry the the target that he has set um, uh, to decarbonize the power sector by 2035 is something we're rolling up our sleeves and, and want to get to work with the administration on. Um, but you know I I look at the how he ran on these issues and what he said in terms of these are the commitments and the policies that I want to implement. Um, these are the here you know and, and here's the pathway to get there. Um, I, I'd also point to a few early decisions that the administration made. First and foremost, um, if you look at the team that he has put in place, they are all, I mean, it's like the dream team for, for climate advocates, right? You've got 
um, you know, somebody who can engage in the international community who has the relationships and the credibility on a global basis to, to, to re-engage in the international conversation about what we need to do to decarbonize the economy and meet those 2050 targets. Uh, and that person is John Kerry. He, but he, and, and then he's also got Gina McCarthy, who was a former EPA administrator under the Obama administration, who has, you know, I've been in the trenches with her working on everything from fuel economy standards to the first um, uh, uh, carbon standards on coal plants. So Gina, between Gina and John Kerry, like and the teams behind them, plus you've just got this you know, this incredible team of advocates across the administration on climate and you've got everybody, your Department of Transportation, your Secretary of Transportation and your Secretary of Treasury talking about creating climate task forces within their own agencies. So I think on, you know, both from the Biden administration and then, you know, so there's what you can do through um, existing authorities. So those are the things that you don't need, you don't need to go to Congress and ask, you can just do those with the stroke of a pen. And, and again, this is an area where the, 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 the president's been very forward leaning um, on, on day one, reversing uh, decisions from anything from, from Keystone to um, some of the, the um, uh, anti-climate policies um, from, from EPA and the Department of Interior. Um, and then there, and then there's Congress, and uh, we see great opportunity to work with certainly both sides of the aisle because we have this. I think there's broad recognition that we have this these two major challenges facing us. One is climate change, and then the second is economic growth. And the strategy that Biden wants to deploy speaks to 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 both of those challenges. And and obviously that's where. ACP sees a, a real opportunity to engage and, and work with this with both the administration and the Congress. Heather, Bill Gates said in his recent book that uh, that getting to a net zero carbon footing by 2050 is the most crucial goal of our moment, um, but also that making reductions by 2030 the wrong way might actually prevent us from getting to zero. Um, and so there's a real sort of tension between you know, a 2030 goal, 2050 goal. What's your take on that? Because you were mentioning both a kind of nearer term goal and longer term goal. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think what's important about this conversation is that it's steeped in science, right? We didn't, Bill Gates, me, Joe Biden, nobody just decided like 2050 is going to be a good year for a target, right? Like we followed what the international scientific community said. And they, they spoke very clearly that we need to hit net zero by 2050 as, 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 as the president has embraced, as Bill Gates talked about, and, and, and certainly as my member companies are, are working towards. Um, but you can't, you can't just sort of set something off in the distance at 2050 and say like, okay, well, we'll, we'll just figure it out along the way and hope for the best, right? There have mm -hmm. to be these checkpoints to, to stop and assess, are we hitting, are we on the right trajectory? Are we gonna hit, where, are we gonna be where we need to be? And because the challenge of climate change is so complicated, it's not, you can't just look at the power sector, right? You have yeah. to look at transportation, you have to look at agriculture, you have to look at the built environment. And so to just kind of say like, okay, like what, like, okay, let's just hope for the best. We'll, we'll, we'll have this 2050 target. You've got to have interim targets to hold not only our country, but globally to hold countries accountable to make sure we're on the right journey. And, and it's going to be, yeah. you know, like, no, one of the, one of my favorite things about uh, Bill Gates and the work he's doing is he has quant he has this quote and it's right on his uh, the the breakthrough institute's website it's you know we today um, produce 51 billion tons of greenhouse gases and we're gonna have to get to to zero in the next 30 years and you just kind of like that that's a that's a pretty good you know like a, a you know reminder of the scale and the scope of this challenge and if we don't have those interim targets that are making sure that we're on the right path um you know we we, we wake up in 2050 and <laughs> look around and the world looks a whole heck of a lot different and it's not a good thing yeah it's amazing how much growth there has been despite all the resistance jobs in solar and wind already outnumber those in coal and natural gas in 30 u.s states um, of course, growth internationally has been enormous. 
Um, but we need to increase the growth so significantly. John Kerry has said uh, that we need to um, increase renewable energy five times faster, phase out coal five times faster, um, transition to electric vehicles at a rate 22 times faster. What, how do we ramp up at that, at the, you know, accelerate um, so quickly? And what, need, what policies need to be in place if it's a carbon tax or otherwise to, to, to really do work within this time frame? Yeah. So um, the, the, the biggest challenge today is that carbon pollution is sort of has no price associated with it. And it hasn't, um, you know, for, for that reason, there just hasn't been a primary focus on like, what do we need to do to, to, to reduce our CO2 emissions, whether that's from the tailpipe, an airplane, a car, um, sorry, a, a car, an airplane or a building. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the goal for many in industry has been to say, okay, let's set a price on carbon. And that needs to, it needs to ha create a long-term price signal. One of the, the policies that uh, Biden ran on is this, uh, is, is called a clean energy standard, right? So in that policy, you are setting, you are basically reverse engineering a price on carbon and creating regulatory certainty and predictability out into 2030 and to tw the 2050 timelines. And what you're doing is requiring a larger and growing share of the, the energy that is being created and produced, a, a, a larger share of that over time then becomes renewables. And that in and of itself, you know, sets the, sets the long-term policy that we really need and the certainty and predictability for my member companies to have the confidence of, you know, continuing to invest and deploy clean energy across, you know, all 50 states. Yeah, but so pricing carbon is a huge effort. We know that John Kerry tried to do that probably with your help in 20, not 2009, 2010. Um, and uh, it's been politically incredibly difficult to uh, get a price on um, carbon emissions. So what will it take and how, what's the path forward? How politically feasible is that in the next you know, year or two years? Well, I, I, a couple of things. Right before I, I joined this call, I was um, actually reading uh, an editorial from my home state senator, uh, Senator Grassley, and he was inviting um, the Biden administration to come to Iowa to see um, the importance of renewable energy and what it's doing to create jobs and power the local economy. He's a Republican from a very red state. And I and he has been a strong advocate of clean power. Iowa as a state is number two in terms of producing wind. Um, and and I think there, I think we are, you know, we a few things are coming together. You see voters that in this last election cycle, they certainly, um, you know, were demanding more of a dialogue around climate change. We had an entire debate just around climate change. There was no other single issue that got plucked out and had it had its own own debate. So I think you're seeing voters are increasingly communicating to their elected officials that this is an important issue, and that is causing both sides of the aisle to think differently about how they respond. I think the the the, the second thing you're seeing is there's no, I mean, clean power is a trillion dollar part of the economy today. And mm -hmm. we're gonna create tons of jobs, whether that's in deploying solar or standing up the nation's first offshore wind, uh, offshore wind turbines. Those are, those are jobs, they are here. They are, this is not an energy source that is some far off, like maybe we can get there. We are creating jobs and communities uh, across all 50 states. And I, I think um, elected officials, again, on both sides of the aisle are, are recognizing that there is an economic opportunity here and we need to find a way um, to, to not get left out of this picture um, and, and to make sure that whether it's, you know, the, the manufacturing of a, of a, of a wind blade or um, the, or, you know, uh, uh, you know, building photovoltaic cells that those jobs are here in America, not, you know, not in China, not in Malaysia. And, and those are, those are real good high paying jobs as you pointed out previously. I mean, there's, 
Um, nobody, want, nobody wants to miss out on, on, on uh, new job creation. So I think a lot of this has to do with our industry working collectively with everybody from environmental advocates to the states and sort of locking arms and helping create more political space for these conversations in Washington to happen. So to be clear, you do think it is politically feasible to have a price on carbon in the, and get a consensus, political consensus around that or enough um, in the next two years? I, I, I think it is going to be a, a tough challenge, but I think it's one that um, I expect this administration is going to prioritize and certainly something that our industry is going to advocate. So I agree with you. I think it's becoming more and more clear across the aisles that climate change is the big biggest job creation engine of our time, largely through clean power uh, and um, uh, development. Um, but at the same time, the fossil fuel industry is seen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, look, there's when you talk about pain, pain comes in a, in a number of different forms, right? Like, we look around at if, whether it was the wildfires that devastated Australia or the hurricanes that were battering our coast this last hurricane season, we have to remember that there is a cost of inaction. And the one thing that I've learned from this COVID, uh, the, from, from COVID writ large, is it is a heck of a lot harder to solve a problem once it's at your doorstep. So, you know, I, it, it is, it's always easy to say like, oh, the path forward is really, really hard, but like, Look at where we are today and the billions and billions of dollars that we are spending to rebuild our communities, the lives that have been lost, the challenges that we face today and in the future are not going away. So we need to get real and practical about that. We also, to your point, need to get, we, we need to have a real conversation about what does this transition look like? How, what, what is, how long does that take? Um, I think a, a really important part of that the, the Biden administration has helped inject into this discussion is what does a just transition look like? Um, how do we bring all communities together? But the idea that like completely changing how you power your economy um, is is like it's and, and again it's not there's not one solution right it's not it's not like <laughs> We can turn a switch overnight and just reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It's good. It's it is going to have to be. It's going to be a journey. There are going to be tough tough points uh, across the system, but I also think we've got to. We also we we can't be afraid of where we've had success. Right. There's a reason that. 30% of the energy in North and South Dakota comes from wind. It's because it's affordable, it's clean, it's reliable. And it, and it doesn't matter if you're in a blue state or red state, everybody can take advantage of it. So yes, it's not gonna be easy, but um, you know, tackling the biggest challenges of our lifetime, we're never gonna be easy. Yeah. And we can either ignore it or embrace it and try to, you know, try to choose the best, the best path forward. And the fossil fuel industries have been and can continue to be in a much more aggressive way, investing in the new energy paradigm, right? Investing exactly. in emissions reductions technologies. They may be very well positioned to move, help accelerate and move this pr uh, process forward and benefit from it if they uh, engage. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, there are- yeah, I mean, you're totally right. I mean, you're, I feel like every day there's, you know, a new, an announcement of a new investment um, from uh, a, a fossil company in wind or solar or storage. There's also a big play um, uh, in, in the EV space. And obviously as, as the power sector, we think a lot about the electrification of the fleet because I want to make sure that if, if we are, if we're using power to electrify our fleet instead of oil, um, that that the power is clean because if you, if we don't make that transition, we're going to miss out on that opportunity. And I know that's something that um, Bill Gates talked a, a little bit about in his speech um, yesterday. But but it is we we can't we can't lose sight of the need to do both and. Heather, I promised to let you go by uh, two thirty Eastern, which and, and we have arrived. But I I do want to bring us back to Texas and bring us back to. Um, the kind of mockery we're seeing from some of the leadership of both the clean power uh, and climate change. Uh, I think it's really important to address the severity of that. Uh, and, and also, you know, in that, within that, um, the enormous 
uh, potential for hope right now. Um, so can can you can you tell tell us what makes you hopeful in the face of this kind of um, you know refusal to recognize uh, the realities of our moment? Well, here's here's what makes me hopeful. I think that in the state of Texas, there's going to be a look back at what went wrong and how do we ensure it doesn't happen again. And in that conversation, there is going to be a discussion about what is the role of storage? What is the role of wind and solar? And there's going to be, a, there are going to be big questions answered about transmission and whether or not we have the right energy infrastructure to take our existing energy portfolio to the next step and to decarbonize it. And that is a conversation that is gonna be happening in Texas. It's gonna, but it's also gonna be a conversation that we're having in Washington. And I think, you know, using, working with Texas to, to identify what went wrong and how we change it for the future can really be a strong platform to getting some of the important legislation passed in Washington that's gonna allow us to create jobs, um, deploy clean energy and, and provide American homes and businesses with uh, with affordable energy, uh, and and that's what that's what I think is is where 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 the big hope and, and opportunity lies. Yeah, I'm so glad you made made that point, Heather. It's really interesting. There's some ways in which the pandemic has been an important accelerator um, uh, of you know uh, uh, resilience strategies toward resilience, and I think you're right. I think that this um, uh, you know. Tra trauma um, that so many Texans are experiencing right now um, will be a reckoning and also um, hopefully, uh, you know, help accelerate, uh, uh, you know, broader strategies outside of Texas and within Texas for um, resilience going forward. Um, and, and very last thing, can you just give us a sense of where you want to be in um, uh, by APC in five years, 10 years? What, what, um, what is your vision for your, your newest enterprise? Well, I, I mean, listen, we're, the, the fact that we have an opportunity to speak in Washington, D.C. with one voice for clean power is a tremendous honor for me. And the vision that our member companies have laid out in terms of getting to the, the ultimate, the 2050 target of net zero um, with, with aggressive interim commitments. If we can, as an industry, work together to do that in a way that is mindful of the just transition that I mentioned, that is mindful of the need to work with labor and, 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 and find a way to, to ensure that we are creating the high paying jobs I mean, that is, that is everything I've worked on my entire life. And I think that's where the opportunity lies, not only for ACP, but for our country as well. And ACP, I, I think I might've said APZ, but I really meant <laughs> ACP. Um, Heather, congratulations, best of luck. We need you to succeed. Uh, we know you will. And uh, it's really a pleasure to connect. Uh, I wish I could share my blizzard with you. Um, <laughs> but uh, I've got my own blizzard happening here in DC. <laughs> yeah, it's coming your way, I'm sure. It's already there. Yes. All right. Um, take care and uh, great to connect. Thank you. Bye, people of World War Zero. We will see you again soon.